as a portrait photographer, it's very important to me that my subjects are sharp and in focus. Now, maybe not my entire subject, but at least their eyes should be in focus. And if there's more than one person, maybe an entire group of people, I want them all to be in focus. So there's times where you'll have a group of people uh, as a wedding photographer, I'm often in the mountains shooting weddings and there's beautiful scenes, beautiful views. And this group of people will want their picture taken in front of it, where obviously they want not just themselves in focus, but the background as well. Well, often I'm shooting with a lens that doesn't allow me to do that. I'm maybe shooting individual people and they don't understand that I can't take a picture of them and have the background in focus because to be honest, if I'm shooting with a portrait lens, getting the background in focus and them is gonna be close to impossible. Well, there's a reason for that and it's called depth of field. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that because it's a very important concept for you to understand. So what is depth of field? Depth of field is the area of your image that is acceptably sharp. So you might have heard of a shallow depth of field or a wide depth of field. Well, what that means, if it's a shallow depth of field, then just a very small sliver of your image is going to be in focus and sharp. Whereas if it's a wide depth of field, well, maybe everything in the image is going to be sharp. So going back to that portrait example where I said I at least wanted someone's eyes to be sharp, well, maybe their nose is not, maybe their ears are not, but at least their eyes need to be sharp and that's a very, very shallow depth of field. Whereas if I'm shooting landscapes, I might want the entire image to be sharp. So I shoot with a very wide depth of field so that not just the foreground, maybe some rocks and branches are gonna be in focus, but everything from those in the foreground all the way back to the mountains in the background should be in focus. That's a very wide depth of field. So once again, just because it's so important, depth of field means the area of an image that is acceptably sharp. Now, when we're talking about depth of field, it's not this sudden transition from soft to sharp. It's actually very gradual. So let's just say my hands represent my depth of field, where everything in between them is sharp and everything outside of them is gonna be soft. Well, it's not this sudden transition where it's just soft, 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 sharp. It goes gradually from very soft up to more recognizable. And then once you hit here, it's gonna be sharp. Everything in here is sharp. And then again, it gradually goes from sharp to soft as we move out this way. So it's not this sudden transition that just starts right here. It's just this gradual fall off from either side. I know this is a lot of information, but it's a very important topic. So if you're still confused, don't worry. I'm gonna send it over to Nassim here and he's gonna show you some live examples of exactly how this works. When it comes to aperture and depth of field, I find that a lot of people struggle with these two concepts, specifically on what depth of field is and how aperture affects it. And a lot of people wonder, well, how do I properly take pictures with my camera so that things are in focus? Well, there's a very easy way to explain this. Now, every digital camera made today has a flat sensor. And if you look at the back of the camera, you have this flat LCD. Well, the sensor inside the camera is sitting parallel to that LCD. And the light that's coming through the lens in front of it is also ending flat right on that sensor. What does that mean? Well, for you to really easily understand depth of field so that it makes total sense is to think of it as a wall. And that wall can be thin, it can be medium size, or it could be thick. And it's always going to be parallel to your sensor. Now your depth of field or this imaginary wall is what's in focus. We call that focus plane. And everything from the front of the wall to the back of it is what's in focus. And if I apply it to the camera, that imaginary wall of depth of field is always going to move with the camera. So this is really cool. Think of it this way. If I'm photographing here, well, my wall is right in front of me, right parallel to that sensor. And if I move this way, now the wall has moved this way, now right in front of me. This is super easy for you to understand, especially in situations where you need to put maybe one person in focus who is com completely out of focus just because of the way they're standing. I have a lot of questions from people that ask, well, I have this group in front of me and they're all in a circle. How do I capture so that everybody's in focus? Well, typical answer would be increase your depth of field by changing your aperture. So you could go from say F 2.8 to like 5.6 or maybe eight. But by doing that, you're changing the aesthetic of the image. Now everything behind your subjects are going to, is going to be probably in focus and you might not want that. Well, if you think of this as the wall, and this is a really easy way for you to understand this, all you have to do is break that circle, put everyone within that wall. 
So from the beginning of the wall to the end of the wall, since you know that that area is in focus, all you have to do is reshuffle people so that they're standing parallel to your sensor. And that's all there is to it. Now we're going to take this concept further and I will demonstrate exactly what I mean so that you understand it easier. Now for this video, we're shooting with an 85 millimeter portrait lens and we set the aperture to be really wide so that I can stay isolated from the background. Now that also means that there's very shallow depth of field. At 85 millimeters and this distance, the depth of field is tiny. You can see it, the camera right now is focused on my face. If I move slightly forward or slightly backward, I'm going to be out of focus. Now the reason why I'm holding these two pine cones in my hand is because what I want to do is I want to demonstrate that plane of focus so that it's easy for you to understand. Now I'm holding this pine cone in front of me and as you can see it's in focus, but I'm not. And the reason why is because we actually change focus to be right in front of that pine cone. So if you go back to that concept of imaginary wall, that wall is now starting to run from the beginning, the front of this pine cone, and maybe it's ending right here. Well, because I'm not inside that imaginary wall, I'm not in focus. So if you're photographing a group and maybe that's the first person in the group, I'm the second person in the group, and maybe you have someone standing right here. Well, guess what? At this aperture, at this distance, there is no way that you can put all of us in focus. So the solution, easy. Go back to that wall and just put them in the same plane. Now look at that. Both of them are in perfect focus. So next time you're out shooting, if you have someone who asks you, take my portrait please with these people, all you have to do is make sure that they're standing all parallel in one plane right across your camera. That's all you have to do. Now this concept of depth of field and this imaginary wall where you're putting things in the same focus plane is not something that's limited to just pine cones and people. You can apply it to any type of photography. So if you're shooting out there, just remember, all you have to do is imagine that wall in front of you, put it in parallel to your camera, and everything within that wall will always be in focus. Now there's one caveat to this imaginary wall. I said that it's always going to be parallel to your sensor. Well, that's true if you're using a standard lens, but if you're using a tilt shift lens or maybe you're using a macro setup with bellows, you can actually bend the setup so that your focus plane is not going to be exactly parallel to the sensor. So just keep that in mind. Right here we have a setup for you to demonstrate how changing aperture impacts depth of field. Now I have an 85 millimeter f1.4 lens and that's its maximum aperture. I went ahead and set the aperture to that f1.4 and I set the lens so that it's at its minimum focus distance. Now at this distance I cannot move any closer. If I do that then things are going to go out of focus. So I went ahead and focused on that Luxia 250 right in front of you and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and change my aperture from f1.4 to 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, and 16. Now f16 is the smallest aperture on this lens so I cannot go any further but you'll be able to see what effect it has on the overall image. Now you can see right here where I have the focus plane right on that Luxia 250. To the left of it I have the B's, the two B's the one on the left, you can see it's slightly sharp, but the rear of the B is not, whereas the other B is completely out of focus. And the same thing is happening to the right side. You can identify some words and letters, but you cannot see everything because that's my focus plane. Now there is a wine bottle behind this and it's literally sitting about maybe half a foot behind the front line here. And you cannot see that it's a wine bottle. You cannot read anything from it. Now watch what happens when I start changing it. So from here we go from f1.4, that's f2, that's f2.8. Now as you can see at 2.8 even, I'm now seeing a lot more things sharper to the left and to the right. f4, 5.6, f8, and now the bottle on the back, you can start seeing that it's an actual bottle. f11, and that's at f16. So at f16 you can now see that a lot of things are sharp, which means that all of that area in the front line, starting from the B on the left side to the lens to the blue box to the right, is within that depth of field. So everything is appearing sharp, you can read the letters, you can see everything. But 
the bottle on the back where it says fade away is still not sharp. It's still a little bit blurry. What does that mean? It simply means that my depth of field pretty much ends there and now it's getting into the blurry zone. And although that bottle is about half a foot away, the depth of field that I have at f16, which is the minimum aperture, is simply not enough to be able to cover this entire area. So how do I resolve this dilemma? How do I get everything in perfect focus and perfect sharpness? Let's talk about that. In order for me to get that bottle to look really sharp so that it falls within the depth of field, there are a couple of things that I can do without changing my focal length or without changing my lens. So first, I can physically move the bottle. And as you can see, right there, looks pretty sharp. And that means that it's now within the depth of field. And the second thing I can do is I can actually move my camera back a little bit, keep that bottle back to where it was, and then I'm simply going to change my camera to subject distance. All right, so compared to what I had before, all I did here was move my setup back. So by moving the camera away from that front line and therefore increasing my camera to subject distance, now my depth of field is actually wider. You can see that the bottle in the back, the wine bottle in the back is now looking much sharper and everything in the front is still really sharp. So that's something for you to keep in mind. If you're already pushing your lens to the limit and you're still getting things that are not looking sharp, then all you have to do is increase your camera to subject distance and just doing that will increase your depth of field. If you're shooting a distant landscape, you could still be at f1.4 and because you're set at infinity, everything might appear sharp still. And that's because all of that landscape in the distance is within your depth of field. So don't think that f1.4 or any wide aperture necessarily translates to shallow depth of field. That's not really the case. We're in downtown Denver today demonstrating aperture and how it affects the way a photo looks. Now we've set up here, I'm working with the model, Melissa, and there's a bunch of columns behind her. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the aperture on the camera, on the lens. We're not gonna change the lenses, we're only gonna change the aperture. So we're gonna go from f1.4 all the way up to f16. That's gonna go from biggest aperture down to the smallest aperture this lens can make. And you will be amazed at how different the background looks between f1.4 and f16. So as you can see, we start with an aperture of f1.4 and that has a very shallow depth of field and it makes a very blurry background. As we change the aperture to f16, depth of field increases and you can see a lot more detail in the background. Right now, we have an 85 millimeter lens on this camera doing video and it's set to f1.4. You can see all these lights behind us are nice and soft and blurry and there's also really big highlights. That's what's called bokeh. Now watch what happens when we stop down the lens to f11. Now we're set to f11 and you can see the background looks a lot different. All those little lights that were big and blurry before are little points of light. So remember, if you want to get a beautiful background like this and beautiful bokeh, make sure and use your lens as wide open as possible, preferably f1.4, f2, or f2.8.